everybody. We're here to tell you what not to do when you're drafting Dominaria. So we're here with the top 10 things not to do when you draft Dominaria. Don't do these things. If you do these things, we will not be held responsible for what happens next. Do as we say and as we do. <laughs> <laughs> Number one. Don't skimp on removal. Okay, so why is this so important in Dominaria draft? So there are tons of really powerful creatures in Dominaria, which sometimes would be problematic if there wasn't enough removal to take care of them. But luckily in Dominaria, there is. Yes. But you've got to make sure that you're actually taking it. Yeah, it's super important because of creatures like Lyra Dawnbringer. They're out Ooh, there. Academy Drake kicked. Yep. You'll lose to that real quick. Cloud Reader Sphinx can take you down, and that's a common. Exactly. So there's a whole bunch of creatures out there just waiting to finish you off, unless, of course, you provide a vicious offering and you do away with them first. Number two, have a plan for flyers, just like we were talking about. Yes. If you leave yourself without, you know, like pierce the sky at the very least. Sometimes if you're playing green, it's as easy as being like, hey, I'm going to actually play this pierce the sky yeah. main deck. Arbor Armament, too, is yeah. not... It's not bad to have exactly. one in your green deck. Sometimes it really it's just like, otherwise you're going to die to an Avon sentry and you're going to feel bad about it. That's just a 3-2 flyer for four. Exactly. <laughs> Guess what? You'll lose to that card and then you'll be like, why didn't I have a plan for flyers? <laughs> also, your plan could just be that like you're the one with them. Yeah, that's with flyers. true. That's true. If you're like, I'm the person who's jamming four Avon sentries and three cloud reader sphinx. Good on you. Yeah, Dominaria is a prime environment for flyers. The keyword flying is even better in this set than it usually is. Yeah. So either win with them or don't lose to them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Three, don't be afraid of splashing to increase the power level or to have more removal. Splish, splash, you were taking a bath and it was a bath filled with Dominaria cards. <laughs> First you of all, didn't get clean, <laughs> but you had a lot of fun. You might have had a lot of paper cuts, too. But yeah, Ouch. Megan is super right. Uh, this set has tons of powerful cards, like we've mentioned already. You know, Lyra Domblinger, Splashable. You splashed a... Uh, I splashed a Sarah, Sarah Angel. Angel. Look, it's not that I recommend that particular course of action, <laughs> but I'm just saying that that draft 3 owed because yeah. the thing about this format is a lot of the games are going to go long enough for you to draw those powerful cards. Right. Or for you to draw the mana that you need to cast them. And this format is about doing super powerful things with your creatures. And so you want to be the person doing those things. Don't be afraid to play around with three colors. Fixing this format is pretty good. Yeah. Skittering Surveyor. Great little buddy. Grow from the ashes. Yeah. Awesome fixing spell. But we're getting ahead of ourselves because tip number four is don't ignore fixing if right. you need it. Grow from the ashes. Uh, expect that to be a pretty high pick for yourself. If you see it coming your way, like third pick, fourth pick, I would consider that card even a signal yeah. because it is so critical to decks that want to play more than two colors, which is quite frankly going to happen a lot in this yeah. format. And do you know what people have been saying? You can play Grow from the Ashes and Skittering Surveyor even in d decks that are two colors because it's so important to be hitting your land drops in this format. Right. You have spells with kicker. You have super powerful flyers at five and above. You know, you want to be hitting those land drops and these cards are nice ways to make sure that that's going to happen for you. So there's a big controversy around the card Navigator's Compass. Oh okay? boy. <laughs> so Ooh. you'll hear impassioned arguments on both sides of this card. And I figure like, let's just quickly talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. So Navigator's Compass, the people who say don't play it, uh, the reason they say that is because it's taking up a, sp a spot in your deck and we talk about things like opportunity costs, like Ornithopter. Well, it's free, so why don't I put it in my deck? Well, it's costing you a card, essentially, any better card that you could put in your deck rather than yeah. the Ornithopter. You only have 40 slots, You right? look at Navigator's Compass and you're like, whoa, this is not great. It says I gain three life and also I can make one land, one color yeah. when I want to. Yeah. Uh, it is, but you know what? Sometimes you play it. Sometimes you play it. I'll be it. honest, I've played it. Yeah, I have I have as well. And I think another interesting point about this is that like you're playing your navigator's compass, you might be fixing your land, but at the same time, wouldn't maybe a two three that was on your color also have lasted you longer in the game if you just played that creature and gotten yourself ahead to the point? You know, I think that sometimes the answer in Dominaria though is no. 
Yeah. Like there's a lot of formats where the answer is yes. A two, three in your original colors is just better. But I think Dominaria, at least in my experience so far, has been a format where sometimes it's like, no, this allowed me to play uh, a Sarah Angel. <laughs> I'm speaking from personal mm, experience yes. right now. This allowed me to play a Tiana. This allowed me to play, you know, so, like some other off color card that was much more powerful and much more impactful in a game of Dominaria Limited than a Talarian Scholar. There's also important to note that this card will trigger your historic spells. So, yeah, that's yeah, true. Uh, a lot of arguments on both sides of this card. So just, you know, play with, proceed with caution. I'll yes. say that. Tip number five. Don't leave your enchantment removal in the sideboard. That's right. That's normally where it lives in most other formats, but in this format, it's so important to have it. The, yes. the equipment is insane. There's uh, there's Black Blade Reforged. Oh, boy. There's Forebearer's Blade. Oh, gross. There's even Jousting Lance oh, sometimes. Right. Sometimes you have to kill a Jousting Lance, yes, for real. sometimes you do. The Eldest Reborn. Yeah, Sagas. These had oh. Sagas. Time of Ice. Oof. Like, guess what? Uh, all of the, like, the rare, we haven't even touched on the rare sagas. No. That's just like, or a Song of Freilis, another uncommon How one. How about On Sarah's Wings? Yes. Uh, you need to get rid of that or else you're going to die. These are all <laughs> cards that you can just straightforward lose to. And uh, you're gonna you're gonna not lose to them if you're putting that enchantment removal and that artifact removal into your main deck. So broken bonds, uh, put it in your main deck. Put a copy in there. Invoke the divine. Put that in your main deck. Yeah, yeah. you're gonna need these cards straight up. You are and. Also, don't forget that Broken Bond has extra text on it. It does. Which I forget a lot of the time. Put uh, You can put a land from your hand into play. Very relevant sometimes. Tip number six. Don't play these trap cards without a very good reason. Okay, do you know what? This is a place where Maria and I are going to disagree a little bit. Because I deleted several cards that she had listed. That's okay. <laughs> but. <laughs> I know but, one of them was Jaya Ballard. I had on this list. That's true. Which um, is a planeswalker. So a lot of times you're like, ooh, sweet, a planeswalker. This can't yeah. be bad. The problem with Jai is her, her the way that she's good is so very, very narrow that uh, a you lot of times- You mean drawing cards? <laughs> <laughs> you mean discarding lands and drawing spells? Uh, okay, yes, that is one of the modes. However, she also costs three red is in her mana cost. So she's kind of difficult to cast. Um, but I think she's probably okay in the wizard deck, right? This is a place where we're going to disagree. <laughs> but I don't want to I don't want to put her in another deck. I just don't. <laughs> if I'm playing red, I'm playing Jaya. Oh, all right. All right. All right. <laughs> what other cards? Uh, what can we agree on? Mox Amber. Oof. Yeah. yeah don't play Mox You're gonna Amber. You're going to need to be in the right spot to play Mox Amber. I mean, like maybe you have a Mistress Self Replicator and you're like, this is great. Yeah. I mean, we have seen it in that yeah. deck specifically. I can't honestly think of another deck. Maybe if you had five Dobnot Trappers or something. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Maybe something like that. That would be a lot of them, but I would I would play it then maybe actually. Fall of the Thran is one that I'm going to say uh, looks super cool. Like you're yeah. destroying lands, uh, but the only home for it is in a hyper, hyper aggressive deck. And if you've made it all the way to six mana and your opponent isn't already dead, I don't know. You probably are going to lose. I think that if you're playing a hyper aggressive deck, you that's a way there, to, your, to close your top the deal. end. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Especially in this format where so many people are relying, especially when they're playing um, decks that that are mid-range or controlling um, and aren't hyper aggressive, they're playing so many five and six drops. Like this is, there's a lot sure. of five drops in this format or they're trying to cast, you know, a three drop and a four drop in the same turn and that's gonna help them stabilize. And then if you follow the Thran and you're being very aggressive, well, yeah, the next couple of turns, they're still gonna be able to cast maybe one thing, but that's usually not gonna be enough to help them stabilize if you have a really big board presence. Okay, so beware fall of the Thran unless you really know what you're doing and you're being extraordinarily aggressive, probably in red, white. Yeah. Uh, Kamal's Druidic Vow, we can Yuck. agree on that. Yeah. I don't know what the home for that is, but I, okay. I, I don't think there is one. I've seen this card whiff so many times. Yeah. And sometimes it like, I mean, you have to be super lucky for it even to hit one thing. Yeah. There's a lot of conditions you need to meet there for that card. So probably just don't. Uh, Flame of Keld, I think, does have a home in some decks. Ugh. Where it's just like, again, like a hyper aggressive deck. I don't. I'm and not that's the one. This. this is the one right where you discard your hand. You discard yeah. your hand and then yeah. you draw. Yeah. What? Great. I'm if you're playing, if you're playing red white aggro, no red black aggro, 
You're playing. You, I'd like to see you play this card. And I would like to see you play this card too when you're sitting across the table from me. <laughs> but I, I think we can agree on Curator's Ward. Yeah. Don't ever play this card. Same. Just yeah, never do no, it. Don't. Thran Temporal Gateway. Don't ever do it. Yeah. People like argue about magical Christmas land with this card, but the thing is, I don't even think there is a magical Christmas land no, with this card. I don't even know. Literally ever. It is so it's so Christmassy there that I can't even imagine it. The air is just filled with peppermint. Not the smell of peppermint, the air is full of peppermint. You know what else? What other card is Magical Christmas Land what? times 100? Primeval's Glorious Rebirth. Oh my gosh, I've seen so many people be like, but you can get back all these legends. And it's like, like well, you had to have legends. like, you needed to have them and cast them. You had and to you already to cast have them. one in play also right now in order to cast and, Primeval's Glorious Rebirth. And they're all Glorious dead Rebirth. already. Yes. I don't know. So all of Not them, happening. but one is dead and then you cast this. <laughs> And okay. And this is a legendary sorcery, and we can yeah. we can offer the same. Like, please be cautious of all legendary sorceries. Yes. Tip number seven: Whew. Don't play legendary sorceries without enough legendary creature support. One hundred percent. So you know what? I what? had someone cast a Yogmoth vial offering against me when they had two legendary creatures in their deck, and they had one of them in play. I was mad. Well, that is very rare. Yeah. That's a rare case scenario. Yes. So yeah, you, and upsetting. <laughs> I think you've got to have five or six legendary creatures in your deck to want to put this in. Yeah. Uh, some people might say four is okay, and I think that is really the bare minimum in order to play one of these. And if you're opening it first and draft, that's you can say, hey, I'm going to draft the rest of my deck around it. So yeah. that's something you can do. But you might even be erring on the side of doing something a little safer, which is just picking a straight up good card. And then if one comes to you later and you've already got all these legendary creatures, you can say, hey, now, now is a fine yeah. time for me to do this. Cause they're, you're not always gonna get them. They're not always gonna I be past you. A lot of them are good enough that you would still, if you're first picking it, they're sure. still first pickable because it's something like Thran's Temporal or uh, I mean, Karn's Temporal Sundering. Sure. It's like, that's a very powerful effect. Um, Urza's Ruinous Blast I've been like less impressed with because it oftentimes won't exile a very important creature you need to exile on your opponent's side of the board. Right. And you're just like, well, great. Yeah. Legendary creatures are running around a lot yeah. in the set, obviously. But like uh, Jaya's Immolating Inferno. Yeah. That card is so good. Yeah, it is. Straight busted. Um, and it's like, yeah, I'll pick it early, but you do need to really draft around it at that point. Make sure you're hitting that legendary creature count. Number eight, have ways to close out the game, especially if the board gets clogged or because the game, you know, is usually going to go long in this format. Yes. So what does this mean? What do you need? Um, going back to like our, when we were talking about flyers, it's yeah. like, hey, do you have like a big flyer or two um, and enough removal to get rid of your opponent's ways to block it? Do you maybe have like a slime foot uh, to to just go ahead yeah, and like drain slimy. them? Yeah, slimy. Honestly, it's as easy as I've talked about how much I like divination in this format. Yeah. And it's like, are you just going to out card advantage your opponent? So eventually you can start running creatures into each other and trading a bunch, but you're going to have the board presence at the end of that because you've been drawing a bunch of cards. And thinking about cards like one of the best cards in the whole set, in bolus clutches. Yeah. Saving that and being very patient with when you play that card. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've seen, and I think I myself at the beginning of this format got would sometimes get very tempo oriented and it just like doesn't, it's really hard to make that kind of strategy pay off. Where it's like, oh, I'm gonna in Bolus's clutches, their five drop, just so that I can get in this one turn. And then sometimes they'll just untap and play like something at least as good or better than what you just Or took. their own in Bolus's clutches. <laughs> exactly, and it's just like, oh man, well, I wish that I had waited because this format is sometimes about just the really big creatures and or having a way to remove those really big creatures. Number nine, we've also touched upon already, don't underestimate equipments or on Sarah's wings. Those, they're great. Yeah, they're so very, very good. Even a, an equipment like Short Sword, if you're yeah. if you're playing a Sapperling deck, can be super powerful and really annoying for your opponent to deal with. Yeah. So if you're, you know, you're opening your first pack and you're like, oh man, I got Black Blade Reforged and like, that's a good piece of equipment. Like you're, you should probably take it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm going to play that card. I'm going to get real with you. Even in a deck where I don't have that many legendary creatures, yeah. it's so good. I think good. I played it in one that had like three or four legendary yeah. creatures. And it's like, well, sometimes I would like a lot of times, again, the games would go long and I'd get to seven mana. And it's like, now I can make a, you know, like my my Avon Sentry is a 11, 10. Yeah, exactly. And and uh, you mentioned um, Jousting Lance mm -hmm. and Forebear's Blade. These are cards that you have to be super wary of 
in the late game as well, especially a card like Forebear's Blade, which can switch mid combat if yeah. something dies. Like and first strike. Like Jousting Lance makes your your creatures so difficult to block. Right. There's so many times when I've been on the, like across the the battlefield from my opponent's Jousting Lance, and it's like I just can't block that creature. Right. There's yeah. like there's nothing I can do about that right now. Like it makes it pretty big and it has first strike on their turn. It's really difficult. And that's another case for packing your enchantment and yeah. uh, equipment removal in the main deck. Finally, tip number 10, don't be afraid of fringe draft strategies like artifacts or mill or focusing on instants and sorceries. Uh, the field is so wide open. I've drafted two Lich's Mastery decks. Oh yeah. It is delightful. And it's just really fun, exactly. right? Exactly. There's so many cool, fun things you can do in this format. And we mentioned it's kind of slow. Yeah. So you have time to be able to do these weirder, crazier yeah. things. And it'll just make you a better magic player if you're like dipping your toe in and trying these things out. Will it always be the greatest deck you ever drafted? No, oh, but, but magic- sometimes <laughs> it will be. It's also what I like having fun too. Yeah. Like it's super great that we have a format like Dominaria that allows you to do do crazy stuff and doesn't mm -hmm. ultimately punish you because you're dead on turn four. Yeah. So yeah, there you have it. There's your top 10 things not to do in Dominaria draft. Hopefully uh, you're able to approach your next draft, a little more knowledge of how to streamline them and get yourself that that W in the draft queue or at FNM. And if you have any like questions or you disagree with us or you agree with us, head into the comments and post what you think about this format. If you have any tips for other people of uh, like what's worked for you. Absolutely. And as always, have fun.